Welcome everybody to our today's webinar with Marco and myself, Franziska. So we at Nanotemper are excited about the new emerging field of gene therapy for many of the same reasons that our customers in the pharmaceutical science are. Uh, Marco, we're going to present today a few new insights how our technology can help you in the field of gene therapy. First of all, a few words about Nanotemper itself, who don't know Nanotemper at all. So what we do, we um, develop and produce uh, bioanalytical devices for big pharma companies and universities. Nanotemper has now over 150 employees and we are located in more than 13 countries around the world. We are based in Germany and founded in uh, 2008. Our mission is to enable um, people to do science that matters by pushing always the limits. Um, since 20 years, we are working together with the top pharma companies as well as the top universities. And especially in the field of drug discovery, we gained a lot of experience for many years. And Marco now will show uh, the solutions for gene therapy by using our Prometheus device. Let's go. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Franzi. Um, yes, gene therapy uh, is a hot topic at the moment. A lot of people are moving in there. And uh, along with that, a lot of uh, questions arise how to deal with uh, analytic questions. And today we want to shed some, some light uh, in this uh, area and want to give you some, some insights how we uh, address those questions. Uh, so the Broad topic is gene therapy, but we'll have a focus on adeno associated viruses uh, today. So topics that we're going to be addressing is uh, we're going to differentiate different serotypes, uh, see what impact the concentration of AAVs has, has on their stability. And we'll also test different buffer conditions and see what influence that has on the stability. Uh, take a look at uh, different stresses uh, and how you can use that for uh, QC testing. We're also going to determine uh, uncoating temperature of a, uh, a virus where the capsid releases DNA and also uh, quantify a DNA loading. Now, uh, there has been uh, some initial successes uh, when it comes to gene therapy, uh, but there's still quite work, uh, quite a lot of work to do uh, down the road. So, as I said, it's, it's a hot topic at the moment. And uh, we thought it would be interesting uh, to give you a very condensed uh, overview of how we can help you here. Now, when you work with gene therapy, typically you identify a target, do plasmid development, do vector development, and finally go into preclinical and testing. Um, the headline here says um, how uh, you can address those questions also with uh, other devices from us, the monolith and the Deantis. However, that's a bit of a separate topic since those instruments address uh, measuring interactions and affinities. But today we're going to focus what you can do with the Prometheus, and this is mostly characterize the integrity of the vector, uh, stability of the proteins, and formulation development and, and QC. So let's dive right in. Um, I mentioned uh, differentiation of different serotypes. You see here uh, several colored lines. Uh, now let me walk through you through a little what you actually see here. So the, the x-axis uh, and all the diagrams that I'm going to show you always will be temperature. So what we're doing is we're taking a sample as it is, no preparation necessary, and we're gradually heat it up. And then via monitoring uh, the intrinsic fluorescence of proteins, uh, we're going to watch the protein unfolding process, which is depicted here just by a fluorescent readout uh, of the ratio of two uh, wavelengths. And uh, the unfolding process then typically looks like a sigmoidal curve. Now, what you can draw out of this information in first instance is uh, when you use the inflection point of that profile, is uh, it's defined as the melting temperature of uh, the protein here, the, the capsid. So you can easily see that uh, the different colored lines have different melting temperatures and the different colors here refer to different serotypes. In that case, four, six uh, and, and eight. 
Um, the other diagrams you see in here is in the middle one, just the, the first derivative of, of the top one. And what we simultaneously detect here uh, is also the aggregation behavior uh, with separate optics in the device. And you also see a difference in aggregation behavior here according uh, to the serotype. Interesting info here is it also works with mixtures of different serotypes, and that's uh, shown here in the in the green line. So since those um, unfolding temperatures actually vary very strongly, um, you're also able to detect uh, mixtures and even determine types of serotypes according to the melting temperature. So um, as I said, the technology behind this is it's called intrinsic fluorescence. We call it nano DSF. Uh, and it's done with a Prometheus. So you can just take 10, you just need 10 microliters of your sample. And since we're using intrinsic fluorescence, there's no need for preparation. You just take the sample, put it in the machine and press play. Mm -hmm. um, Marco, this also means if, if we can distinguish different serotypes and also a mixture of different serotypes. In this case, we can see it because um, the melting temperature differs, right? So if it's the same exactly. melting temperature, we can't see the difference, right? Uh, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. So that's a bit of the uh, the advantage here that uh, concerning the different zero types, the uh, melting temperature actually differs very much. And mm -hmm. generally what you see, I mean, you could also work with uh, unpurified samples. Um, so there's no need to have highly purified only one type of protein sample. Uh, like it, it could even work, it even works in crude extracts, uh, but the uh, profile you get always is, a, let's say, a summary or a sum up of all the proteins unfolding. So your protein of interest at least should have the, uh, the dominant part of the, the mixture you have there. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean by little amount of sample? So there's written 10 microliter of sample. Mm -hmm. What is about the concentration of, of the protein sample? Um, so for one profile that you see here, you need 10 microliters, but the concentration actually can vary from uh, several hundred milligram per mil uh, down to five or several uh, microgram per milliliter. Okay. Um, but since we're talking about uh, concentrations, uh, we actually also tried uh, the, the same serotype, um, let's say same buffer, um, just at different concentrations. And uh, we also see here a big difference. Now on the slide before, we talked about the, the melting temperature here, the inflection point of the unfolding profile. Now you see here that it actually doesn't differ very much, if at all. But what does change uh, in dependence of the, the concentration is uh, a second parameter that we can read out here is the onset of melting. So the lower the concentration, the earlier the unfolding process starts, which leads to a, let's say, shallower transition, uh, which is also indicated here in the, uh, in the lower diagram, which is just the first derivative of the, of the top one. Um, and also you can, uh, let's say, quantify that a bit more specific if you take the slope at the unfold from the unfolding profile at this inflection point here. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, you are uh, able to determine the, the best concentration for your sample and you're very, uh, it's actually very easy to quantify that. Mm -hmm. How do I get those parameters? Do I have to set up something specific or how is it working? Um, that's a good question. Um, the um, the uh, inflection temperatures, the melting temperature, and also the, the onset of melting are calculated automatically. Uh, and then there's um, vast possibilities in the analytic software to actually draw a lot more information out of the unfolding profiles like the slope at uh, the in inflection point. Uh, but to get to one of those diagrams, it's actually just a few mouse clicks and then, then you're there. OK. Yeah. Um, not only different concentrations uh, can have influence on the stability, 
we here have also an example of different buffer conditions. I, in this case, I just called it buffer one and two. But you see, when you follow uh, the red line, uh, this has a very distinct unfolding profile uh, compared to the blue buffer here, uh, which has, uh, as say, a rather shallow transition, uh, which is also very easy uh, um, seeable in, in the first derivative. But actually, probably even more important, you see that the aggregation behavior of the blue buffer is a lot more significant, a lot more uh, um, visible than uh, what you get in red, the red buffer, in this case, buffer two. <clears throat> so it means um, buffer two in this case would be the better choice to handle and, and store your, your viral particle. Mm -hmm. So that means that uh, the proteins are in different buffers at the same um, concentration, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you're actually not limited uh, in the, the type of buffer. Uh, in this case, we just chose two uh, separate buffers, uh, but the assay as such is um, buffer independent, so it works in any uh, type, any pH, any salt add-on will work and, and get your result. Mm -hmm. um, also work not done by us, but actually by uh, Kevin O'Brien from uh, Written X Bio. Uh, he had a little uh, conference uh, talk where he was uh, elaborating about uh, how you can use uh, the unfolding profiles to assess uh, non-stressed versus uh, stressed conditions for AV. And of course, you can use that very easily to um, assess also quality control. Uh, you can test, for example, well, actually, whatever kind of stress uh, you can think of, but I think typical ones are uh, different uh, multiple freestyle cycles, for example. And what you see here is um, that the blue, the stressed uh, sample has a decreased stability and therefore uh, you can very easily depict the, uh, the influence on, on stress. And on top of that, actually, those results were in good agreement with uh, in vitro relative potency uh, assays mm -hmm. um, that they did. So do I get it right that if I have, um, let's say, a potency assay with a stressed versus non-stressed protein or AV, and when I see in the potency assay that um, um, the potency is different and I record then those unfolding uh, curves, with a different inflection point, I can then skip my potency assay and just run a fast um, nano DSF run, and then I can conclude if my AV is good or not good. Well, at least uh, what you'll get is um, a quick understanding if this what sample you get will differ from the perfectly stored non-stressed ones. And as long uh, as those lines perfectly lay over each other, I wouldn't worry so much. As long as you see a difference, then maybe it's worth checking where uh, where would you go from there, what happened. Mm -hmm. um, now, we, we looked a lot at uh, the inflection points and also the thing. Uh, when you take a very close look at the uh, early stages of unfolding, we're looking here at the temperature from between 30 and, and 60 degrees, uh, you are able to distinguish between uh, full and empty capsids. Um, and you're also able to determine the, uh, the temperature of encoding here. It has been automatically determined here by the software. Um, the theory is that the, the DNA actually stabilizes the, the structure of uh, the viral capsid. And therefore, in the uh, full version, which is here the green, um, sort of pushes or stabilizes the, um, um, the, the integrity or stability uh, to just open at a very higher temperature. And this is what you can also get out of the uh, unfolding profiles. Mm. Now, we're able here to distinguish between full and empty, but what we got uh, is that it act actually would be very helpful to uh, quantify uh, the loading with DNA. And this is what you did here. So, um, 
we are still having temperature increase on the x-axis. But what's changed now here is not we're not taking a ratio, uh, but we're just looking at the fluorescence intensities. Um, and you'll see that um, it's the same concentration of viral particles. Um, but as soon as there's a DNA introduced, the fluorescence intensity drops. And this is because our assay works uh, with um, in a way that will excite the intrinsic fluorescence in a UV range, and that's also where DNA absorbs. Uh, so you actually very uh, can very easily quantify the the loading of DNA here with a with a viral particle. And that's it. We uh, just want to give you a little uh, impression of what's possible. As I said, um, there's a lot of different questions you can address with just looking at the unfolding profile. Uh, I showed you, you can differentiate serotypes, uh, you can find the, the best concentration and in general the, the best buffer for your formulation. Uh, you can use it for QC testing, uh, assess uh, different stress influences, you can determine the temperature of uncoding and you can even quantify the DNA loading. Um, and that's actually all within one essay. So for all that questions, you don't need to change the, the setup or the way you run the instrument. Uh, so you can actually place all the samples you have within one run and then you're good to go. Um, thank you, Marco, for, for the presentation. I have one last question. Okay. As we see nowadays, we need really fast and precise results. Can you provide an example how many samples you can measure and in a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so within one run, you can uh, measure up to 48 samples. And one sample is actually one unfolding profile that you saw in, in those diagrams. And um, the, the time for one run depends a little on the, on the, let's say, conditions you set. But typically within 30 to 45 minutes, it's very easily possible to get uh, a full range of unfolding profiles. And um, if you if you want to go really high throughput, you see on the image there's a robotic arm next to the device. Um, you can actually automate it, the, the, the instrument in a way that you can measure up to 1,500 uh, samples unattended uh, just by placing your 384 well plates in there and then the robot and the device will do uh, the work on their own. Thanks, Marco, for that example. Um, I got it. And in general, thank you for the presentation and all the new insights and how we can use the Prometheus in gene therapy. You're, you're welcome. Uh, maybe one more thing. Uh, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning, um, if you're working with viruses, and um, you actually are in, at a different stage and one need to measure interactions of the virus with the uh, relative partner. Um, there's also another webinar focusing on viruses and how we deal with uh, measuring interactions and affinities. So uh, maybe also check this out. Um, if you're interested in what we can do with gene therapy, uh, just uh, fill out the form, uh, contact us, and we'll get back to you uh, as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching. Okay. Bye-bye.